Okay, okay um, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Dougal Matthews in full. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I am here to talk to you about, huh, hang on, that's not plugged in. I knew I'd forget something. Apologies, yeah. Yeah, so, and as, as you said, I'm here to talk to you about uh, 10 years of EuroPython and the Python community, um, which is a title which is too long, which I failed to shorten. But um, thank you all for coming along. Um, it's great to have so many people in Scotland for EuroPython this year, um, and I hope you're all having a great week so far. And in this talk, the sort of the alternative title, which is developing over today, is that I, I'm also going to tell you about how I ended up standing up here tired and ghost-like, or a husk of a man, I've been called. People are basically telling me constantly today uh, how tired I am. Um, and it's true, I'm extremely tired, but I'll uh, try, and, try and keep things together. But um, I'll explain that a bit later. So th this is a, a fairly unusual talk for me. It's a, a personal story. It's one about my journey over the last 10 years. And the first thing I'd really like to say is that I'm, I'm extremely privileged and lucky to have been able to go to EuroPython for 10 years in a row now. Um, so th this is my 10th EuroPython. Um, and it's been a great experience. And I, I really want to just share how that's been for me and what I've learned over the years, what I maybe wished I'd learned sooner or what I wish I'd done sooner in the process. So I think this is probably best for people which are fairly new to the community or they've been around for a short while, but they're maybe looking to do a bit more or get more involved or how they can get the most out of um, EuroPython and the, the community as well, at large. So when I was doing some research for this, I wondered how big EuroPython was actually before I came. And it seems we were looking around sort of mid to high 200s for the sort of four years before. Um, I'm not sure what happened in 2007 to cause it to drop down, and I couldn't actually find numbers for 2008, which was the, the last year before I came. Um, and this year I'm told that there were 1,300 tickets sold, so it's grown quite a bit in the, in the last 10 years. Um, and there was some growth there in those numbers, but you can see it really started to trend upwards when I started coming, so you can uh, draw your conclusion from that if, as you wish. The first two years were uh, 2009, 2010, and that was held in Birmingham in England. Um, and this was really my, my first introduction to the conference, or sorry, to the community. Um, and one thing I, I meant to say earlier is that this talk is gonna be really light on slides. Um, it's very much just me sharing a personal experience, so there's not gonna be a whole lot up there. It's mostly gonna just be there, keeping me roughly in, on track, um, but no promises. I had been using Python for a little while before the conference, sort of on and off um, before 2009, sorry, and I can't really remember how much, it wasn't really that consistent, um, but I'd been following people online and be reading blogs and just tracking things in general. But going to the conference was really my first introduction to the community and all the people involved in it. Um, I was really sort of in awe and kind of overwhelmed, to be honest, at the first time I was there. There's just so much enthusiasm and everyone's so welcoming. And there's also so many incredibly smart people, which I had sort of idolized at least a little bit just because I had followed them on Twitter or read about things that they'd done. And there I was, I was just, I'd just finished studying at university. I had basically no money. Um, I just managed to scrape together enough money to get a student ticket and I stayed at my sister's house, which happened to be nearby for the first year. So that was quite lucky. Um, and I don't know, it, it's, everyone seems so far away from me, but. I think really over the first two years, as I started to speak to more people, you realize that everyone, they're just people and they're all just trying to do their thing, trying to make the most out of the community. They're trying to do something. And you essentially should just take a similar approach yourself. Um, it's also interesting to note that the 2009 EuroPython was the first EuroPython after 2000, sorry, after, uh, after Python 3 was released. It was released late in 2008. Um, so while we're only really seeing the end of Python 3 now, I've actually never attended a, a EuroPython that didn't have Python 3 um, being released, which surprised me. I don't, I don't recall any Python 3 being discussed back then. It was maybe a sort of lofty, is anyone doing Python 3 yet? And slowly the, the, sort of the answers have increased as more people are, are getting involved. Um, and speaking of being sort of a bit starstruck, uh, Guido attended EuroPython that, um, in 2010, and I remember sort of bumping into him in a lunch line, and I just had no idea what to say. I mean, I, he, was, he was really high on a pedestal for me then. Um, I, I did bump into him at a later EuroPython and spoke to him a little bit, but, you know, 
Um, it's, it's just it's quite interesting how you, how you view these people, um, but it's best just to realise that we're all just, just regular people at the end of the day, um, just doing our, our thing in the Python community. Uh, Birmingham is actually quite a nice city. It's got really great Indian food, if you like that. Um, but I would say the, the venue struggled a little bit with the size of the conference. Um, one of the biggest takeaways for me from Birmingham was actually meeting uh, Mark Smith, who's sitting in the front here. Um, and the reason that that was important is together we then started Python Edinburgh. Um, since then, I've moved away from Edinburgh, and he has kept running things. Um, but that was my first time organizing anything, really. Um, and organizing Python Edinburgh was, it was a great, great experience. I met so many people and companies local, um, which otherwise I would never have really came across. Um, and using that experience, I later uh, started Python Glasgow um, and had a similar experience with that. Um, I, just, I still run that today. Um, after Birmingham, the conference moved to Florence. And I would say that Florence was really seen um, as seen fondly by a lot of people. I think it's some of the favorite years for um, a lot of the people that I know that still come to Europython. And we were there for three years in a row, 2011, 12, and 13. And really, it was just a combination of a number of things which really worked well, I think. Um, the city is great, the food is great, the weather is great. The, uh, the venue was actually really good, although we were uh, reaching the limits of its capacity, I would say, towards the end of um, the time in Florence. And for me, um, personally, I started speaking in Florence for the first time. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it was 2011 or 2012 was the first time I spoke. And, but there was a, an error we made in the, sort of the organization um, in that I submitted two talks because I wanted to make sure that I would speak. I had a good chance of speaking. And I had both talks accepted. I was too green and sort of nervous at the time to realize that I should have said, I'll just do one of them. Um, so there was me speaking for the first time. And I had to prepare two talks. And I was really not well equipped for doing that at that point. Um, and to make things worse, there was actually uh, two other talks which were very similar to both of them. Like, you know, there was one similar to each of my talks. And they were both by people which were far more experienced and knew a lot more about the topic than me. Um, but I think they mostly went over OK. They could certainly have been better, but it was a great place for me to start. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, I would have certainly only done one of them. Um, and now we have a one talk per speaker rule, which is definitely a good thing. But I think it's really important to realize that being speaking at conferences, you don't need to be a master in a subject. You don't need to be a master speaker. You just need to have something that you want to share, and hopefully you can convey that message across to other people. Um, and speaking is something that you get better at over time. I'm still far from a master at speaking. Um, but I think I'm slowly getting better as time goes on. So it's good to start speaking if you're interested in it. Start early and try and speak regularly and often to improve as, you, as time goes. The other th really important thing for me at, at this sort of time was I made, made a lot of friends in Florence. There was the, uh, a bar very close to the venue, which is practically legendary at this point. Um, if you ever hear people refer to the river bar, um, there's some people are still looking for a river bar um, at new conference venues. But essentially, this bar was right next to the conference, and everyone just kind of congregated there. And it was a really good socializing point. And it was close enough that people could like, go back and forth between the conference and the bar, which may or may not be a good idea. Um, but it was just a really good place to network and meet people. Um, and at the same time, I also made a lot of friends that were working at Red Hat, which proved useful for me later on um, when I was made redundant and then was looking for a job. I suddenly had some connections which helped me at least speed up the process for getting an interview and so on. Um, Florence, the, one of the things which I think is it's either good or bad, depending how you feel about it, um, this is when EuroPython changed to five days of talks and the trainings were running in parallel. Um, so in Birmingham, it had actually been two days of trainings and three days of talks and then two days of sprints, which is the same format we have this year. Um, but in Florence, somehow it changed into a five-day talk slash training marathon, which was extremely tiring. But it also meant you had more time in Florence, so that's good and bad. But just by the end, I think everyone was really uh, struggling. After Berlin, sorry, after Berlin, after Florence, um, the conference went to Berlin. Um, it was a very different experience, I think, compared to Florence. It's a much bigger city. Everyone tended to be more spread around. 
it was harder to like meet up with everyone. Like, I don't know, you, in Florence, it was, you wanted to meet people, you'd walk somewhere. In Berlin, you wanted to meet people, you had to go and get the, the metro, I, I forget what they call it exactly. Um, but it was generally, it was a really, a really good um, location as well. Uh, the, the biggest thing that happened to me at uh, EuroPython is um, Tom Christie was talking there. He is uh, a good uh, Pythonista friend, but he's best known, I think, for his Django REST framework work. Work. Um, however, in Berlin, he was actually presenting um, MK Docs, a documentation tool which he'd written for Django REST framework, and he'd spun it out into his own project, and he was just promoting it. Um, I was sitting, I mean, honestly, I, I, I attended it because I was Tom's friend. I wasn't actually that interested in documentation, um, which is kind of funny. I don't know, I, I value it a lot more now, which is good. Uh, but during the talk, he really persuaded me about the sort of a lighter weight workflow for doing your documentation was really important. It allowed you to focus on the things which um, are more important than you can care about. Um, but like a lot of people do, I was sitting there with my laptop and I got a bit distracted by in the talk. I was looking at the MKDocs GitHub and the website and I was like, it looks quite nice. But then I noticed that the build was broken and I, I was triggered. Um, so I, I stopped listening to the talk. I was like cloned the repo. I was running the tests. I was like, what, well, is this test broken or is the code broken? I was like, I couldn't really figure it out. But basically um, a broken test had been committed or uh, change that broke the code um, was had been committed, um, and after that, I eventually figured it out, and Tom helped me merge it. I think later I actually found out that they were both broken, and I just like, kind of made a slightly different broken. Um, but this is what happens when you try and figure out um, a failing test where you have no idea what the what it should be doing. But that, that led to me being involved in the project for uh, several years. I was the, I, the primary developer, I guess. Um, I never really had a, a title or anything, but you know, I was, I was the most active developer on the project. Um, it is a, a markdown documentation tool. It's, it's really quite useful. I, I don't use it as much now at the moment, um, just because I, I essentially have Sphinx dictated on me for other reasons. Um, but I certainly miss using it um, as much as I used to. Um, and on, sort of related to that, um, MKDocs has recently been reaching a 1.0 milestone. And so somebody called Waylon, um, I actually don't know his surname, which is, I'm ashamed to say, uh, but he has been driving the project forward lately. He's also the maintainer of Python Markdown. So even if you don't use MKDocs, there's a good chance you've used um, uh, Python Markdown, because I think, I'm pretty sure that's the most popular uh, Markdown Python library. Anyway, if you're interested at all in MKDocs, it's worth checking out because there's a lot of changes that are coming with it very soon. It's on a release candidate for the 1.0, so testing and feedback is very welcome. After Berlin, we then moved to Bilbao. Bilbao is a, it's, it's a nice city, actually. I was a bit surprised by it. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I. I, I had been when I was younger, but I hadn't, when I was much younger, I didn't really remember it. Um, but there was, a, there was a lot of nice places to visit there. Uh, it was more spread out, I think. Yeah. And I, I think after Berlin, a lot of us were still longing for Florence, and we, we maybe still are, but that's, that's a different, different one. Um, Guido then came again in 2015. So this is when I met him, and I actually started to realize he was more just a human being and not the, the Superman that I'd originally imagined. Um, which I don't mean to belittle anything he's done, because obviously he is great, but he is just a, just a man. And I, I did speak to him again then, so that, that, that time I felt slightly less embarrassed about uh, fumbling in front of him, but there we go. Um, but during this time, I, I got more involved in the EuroPython organization. Um, so this is when I joined the program work group, um, which is, means I was basically voting on talks and helping um, shape the conference schedule. Um, and if you've ever been to EuroPython, you've been to a conference and you've looked at the schedule and you've been like, oh, this talk shouldn't have been accepted or this talk should have been accepted or maybe this should be moved around here, then you should really help out in the program work group because that's essentially the things that we're looking to find out. We're, the more eyes we have on this, the more we can improve it and so on. It's, it's, it's a really difficult task because you have, um, I don't know, four or 500 proposals and you're trying to figure out which are the best ones without having heard any of the speakers speak before in a lot of cases. Um, but the, the other thing that happened to me during Bilbao is when I, I, I guess I got a bit burned out with MKDocs. Um, I, 
I moved, I stepped back from the project. And that was actually a fine thing for me to do. I, I just wish with the hindsight I'd, I'd handled it a bit better. I just kind of went radio silent because I just, I think I just rage quit one day essentially. And I was like, right, I'm not, I'm not dealing with anyone else's bugs. So I think I, I essentially allowed myself to get to a point of burnout um, when really it's good to try and identify these things and step back or get more support earlier on. Um, it's, it's always very hard to identify these things though, isn't it? Um, I, I would say that the, the one problem I have is I don't like leaving something unfinished, but when is software ever finished? Um, so you keep, you keep trying to get there, but you just, it's, it's a, like um, chasing your tail or something if you're a dog. After Bilbao, we then went to Rimini, and this is, this was, I, I think, the strangest of all the Europython venues. It's, uh, it's kind of a touristy uh, city. Um, the, the, somebody who's mostly Italian, he, he, depending on his mood, he's either calls himself Italian um, or not. Um, but he, he told me that Rimini is not really Italy. Um, and, and that's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting, I think he's got such a touristy place, it doesn't really feel like most of other places in Italy. But during the, the Rumini conference last year, I got more involved in the program work group and it allowed me to learn more about the process and how things work. So you, I mentioned that we are responsible for selecting the schedule and sort of crafting it. Um, but some of you might be thinking, but what's the uh, community talk voting for? Isn't that doing that job? Well, it actually, it, what happens is the, anyone that buys an early bird ticket or submits a talk is able to vote on all the other talks. Um, and based on the result of that, we use that information to guide our selection process for talks. Um, and the reason it needs lots of um, handcrafting afterwards is that you'll find if there's a buzzword topic in one year that the, you look at the top 10 talks and maybe five of them will be on that topic. So I think this year there were a lot of sort of data science, deep learning talks that were in the top 10. Um, so we didn't want to select all of them because you need to have a good diversity in both speakers and topic contents. Um, but it does raise the question of, is, is talk voting a good thing? And I'm, I'm definitely a bit conflicted about this personally. Um, we've had some problems with it in the past. Um, so for example, one year there was a, a talk with just the title, there was something about programming in Go and it had no mention of Python. Um, and Go was like hot and new that year. So everyone was like, oh yeah, let's vote the, the Go talk. But I don't think anyone had opened it because from memory there was no even abstract for the talk. It was just, um, it was just an empty talk, it was like, literally five words. People were like, yep, yeah, I've got to go to that Go talk. <laughs> um, and we had to sort that out later. It's one of those things that then got missed until quite far down the line just because there's so much going on. So I, I think we just need to, we can keep using this process, but we need to make sure that we're doing a sufficient amount of handcrafting and um, curating of the process afterwards because you can't rely on the quality of the reviews because you don't know how long someone is spending reviewing. Are they just going in reading only the titles and nothing else or, or not? It's really difficult to have that information. Um, but I think otherwise, generally, it's really rewarding to be involved in the program work group and trying to help out. It helps me feel like I can improve EuroPython. And since I then attend EuroPython, it's kind of a, a win-win for myself. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the easiest thing to contribute to, because um, there's the conference still relies heavily on a core group of people doing the vast majority of the work. Um, but then the, if you're somebody like myself who wants to help, but I don't have the time to throw my life at the conference, it's hard to be on the, um, the edges and understanding what's going on. Um, so sometimes you, you just feel like you don't know enough to help, but you want to help. And I, I don't really know how we solve that problem, but it's, I think it's a, kind of an interesting one to be addressed. Some central place for all the relevant knowledge would be a, a, possibly an idea. But not a wiki. <laughs> so for me, really, I think attending EuroPython was just the start of my... Um, introduction to the community. I, when I first came to EuroPython, I was like, hey, I've, I've made it. I'm like, I'm a Python person. Oh, I'm, I'm at EuroPython. Um, but really, there's so much more that you can do beyond just coming to EuroPython in terms of running your own user group or just attending one if you have one locally, submitting your own talks and trainings, or there's help desks. You can do a lightning talk. It's a great way to get started. There's the posters. Um, sorry, there's like a fly. <laughs> That will not come up in the video, and I'll just be like this. <laughs> anyway, um, 
yeah, and and obviously it's really val sorry, it's really rewarding to also contribute to open source, like my involvement with MK Docs, as I said. Um, but it's also more important to look after yourself. So don't do it at the at the expense of burnout. Um, you can be uh, a bit battle scarred by that. But what I really feel is that the community is what you make it, or what you get out of the Python community is like a multiple of what you put into it. If you just attend, you're gonna have a great time and you're gonna sort of involve, like be really involved and enjoy it. But if you start doing more in the community, you're then gonna find that that's sort of multiplied back at you. Um, and there, there's a quote which uh, is probably over quoted by this point, but um, the, the sort of the come for the language and stay for the community by Brett Cannon. Um, I think it was on a t-shirt for PyCon or, uh, I mean, it really resonates with me basically. It's, um, if it wasn't for the, the Python community, I would have probably moved on by now, I would have thought. Um, and I basically owe much of my career and many of my friends I've met through EuroPython or through the Python community, whether it's been at the conference or more locally with the user groups. And that, that then brings us to Edinburgh this year. Um, and as I said before, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. So they, we have actually gone back to the, the old structure we had in uh, Birmingham. Maybe that's a, a UK structure, I don't know. Um, but everything that's sort of old is new again. And it's probably a bit too early for me to r do some kind of retrospective thinking about this year's conference. But I, I do start to wonder about how will this conference be remembered? So the 2009 one I said was the first one with Python 3, maybe this will be the last, we'll remember this is the last one with Python 2, hopefully. Um, or maybe this will be the last year of Python when Scotland was in the EU, and that will make me sad. I mean, obviously the whole of the UK, but Scotland in particular. Um, or maybe this will just be the year of Python when I had a six month old, it doesn't let me sleep at all, and that's why I'm extremely tired. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I got here, and that's how I um, ended up standing and speaking to you all. As that's the, the journey I've had, and yeah, having a kid is tiring. <laughs> um, but just for just to finish, uh, something completely different. If there's anyone that's running, there's a run um, happening at the end today. John Sutherland, who's down at the front here, is organising it. I guess. Do you feel like you're organising it? Yeah. Um, and you're meeting at the front of the conference centre after the lightning talks, I believe. Um, so if anyone's interested in running and, and you have your running stuff, uh, we're going to head to Arthur's seat and I'm going to try and have enough energy for it. Um, otherwise, um, if you're interested in OpenStack uh, at all, I'm doing an OpenStack help desk tomorrow. Um, so yeah, come and speak to me about that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's everything. So uh, thank you very much. I, I don't really plan on taking questions. I'm happy to, but it doesn't really feel like it makes sense with this talk, to be honest. Um, so just come and speak to me. Um, yeah, that's probably better. All right, thanks.